my name is Chris Krauss. I'm currently the chair of the classics department um, at Yale. That said, I'm now going to back off and um, introduce you to the introducers, the two uh, uh, faculty members who are organizing the series currently, uh, beginning with my beloved former colleague, Irene Perano Garrison, who is currently the Pope Professor of Latin at Harvard, if you can believe it. So, Irene. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to see uh, the community gather to hear Shelley Haley today. Um, thank you, Chris, uh, and also to my co-organizer, Yesha, for uh, inviting me back for this momentous occasion. Um, I uh, want to tell you a little bit about the background to this lecture. Um, it was the spring of 2018 when Ayesha and I were asked, I believe by uh, Emily Greenwood at that point, to take over the uh, organization of the Pari Lectures after uh, our colleagues, uh, Chris Krauss and David Quint had quite a long uh, stint in that position. And as uh, Ayesha and I began uh, plotting a, a, a strategy and a course for the Pari Lectures, um, it became, became immediately clear to us um, that race was uh, a topic that was ubiquitous and bubbling uh, beneath the surface in so many conversations and encounter that we were having with students and colleagues, but a, a topic that at that point wasn't present enough um, in academic discourse and frameworks that we were encountering in our work in pre-modern studies, certainly at Yale. Um, how to talk about uh, race from a historical perspective, how to draw from critical frameworks um, uh, in ways that are sensitive to the specificity of the pre-modern world, and above all, um, a, a topic that is very dear to us, how how to weave scholarly narratives and perspectives in and out of reflections on embodied identities in the here and now, these all seem really pressing questions to us at the time. We were immediately drawn to uh, Shelley Haley's exemplary investment uh, in all of these questions from angles that are at once scholarly, deeply political, but also deeply personal. Um, and uh, you will all might immediately recognize um, uh, in particular her trailblazing work on Fanny Jackson Coppin and other Black women classicists and other seminal contributions uh, on translation, race and the classics that uh, I'm sure my colleague uh, Ayesha will mention momentarily. We initially planned this lecture uh, for March 2020, but as we all know, uh, back then uh, we were in the grips uh, of the um, ep epidemics um, and we were forced to postpone. Uh, we could not have predicted uh, a year or even two years ago that um, the summer of civil unrest and awakening um, that we experienced uh, last year after the murder of George Floyd and that of so many other made the questions all the more pressing and avoiding those questions uh, unconscionable, frankly. We're grateful to Professor Haley for accepting the original invitation, and we're so excited for the opportunity that this unavoidable uh, postponement uh, provides us to engage with her groundbreaking work and learn from her unique personal voice. So thank you, and uh, on to you, Ayesha. Thank you, Irene. Um, and this is one of those lectures where there is a chain of introductions, which uh, is, is no less than what I think uh, Shelley Haley certainly deserves. Uh, before I, I do the, the, the ritual formality of introduction, I do want to uh, point briefly to an extension of what Irene uh, began to talk about, which is the intersection of voice, critical subjectivity, and the nature of our scholarship. Uh, the Barry Lecture in Classics and Comparative Literature speaks to a very wide range of scholars, those not just in classics, but those of us who draw on and are adjacent to and uh, engage variously with the work in classics, in comparative literature, in other literary and um, uh, humanities disciplines at large. I want to begin by noting that Shelley Haley's work first came to my attention, not for her work as a classicist, but because I was teaching a course in Global Shakespeare's. And I wanted to find uh, an, an essay that would introduce my students to the challenges of reading Shakespeare's Cleopatra. Um, and the essay that I assign regularly now is uh, Shelley's classic essay from the early 90s, Black Feminist Thought and the Classics, um, an essay that blew open my students' minds. Um, 
not only for its careful uh, working through of the manner and mode of scholarship on a complicated subject like Cleopatra, but also for its ownership of her own position as a scholarly subject, as a student, as a member of many complex overlapping communities. Uh, and it is that voice that I think has reached scholars across a very wide range of disciplines and that I certainly, and I know many others here today are excited to hear. Uh, so by way of introduction, I would actually like to start with some words uh, that Shelley herself has written, which I think are particularly crucial for our own moment today as we begin uh, this Barry lecture. Um, quoting Patricia Williams, uh, Shelley Haley writes in that uh, seminal essay, Black Feminist Thought in the Classic, she, um, this is, and this is Williams, my attempts to write in my own voice have placed me in the center of a snarl of social tensions and crossed boundaries. And reflecting on that quote, Shelley writes, think of the possibilities in my case, feminist classicist and woman classicist, black classicist and black woman's classicist, and black feminist and black feminist classicist. If oxymoronic odds come in degrees, I would be somewhere near the high end. How did I come in this location as a black feminist classicist? I welcome Shelley Haley here, both for her extraordinary uh, career. Uh, she is currently the president of the Society for Classical Studies. Um, and she is Edward North Chair of Classics and Professor of Africana Studies at Hamilton College. Professor Haley earned her BA from Syracuse University in 1972. She received her MA in 1975 and her PhD in 1977, both from the University of Michigan. An expert on the figure of Cleopatra, she has lectured widely on increasing the representation of students of color in Latin, ancient Greek, and classics classrooms, and on her research about the role of a classical education in the lives and careers of 19th century college-educated Black women. Her publications include Fanny Jackson Coppin's Reminiscences of School Life and Hints on Teaching, 1995, and numerous articles on the role of women in the ancient world and on race in the discipline of classics. In 2017, she received an award for excellence in teaching at the collegiate level from the Society of Classical Studies. It's with enormous admiration and uh, a certain amount of modeling uh, and exemplary uh, awe that I welcome Shelley Haley to give the Barry Lecture. Welcome, Professor Haley. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it's, it's an absolute honor to be here. Um, I would like to start first with a land acknowledgement. I respectfully acknowledge the Oneida Nation of the Haudenosaunee, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement demonstrates solidarity and commitment to the beginning of the process of dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Um, I'd like to thank um, the, the departments of comparative literature and classics for inviting me to deliver the Perry lecture. I really am uh, beyond honored um, to do this. Uh, and I wanna give a special shout out to Aisha and Irene for uh, persisting <laughs> with, with the invitation. Um, you, you both have been wonderful contacts and, and great models for um, um, how to um, treat guests that, that you invite um, to give a lecture. Um, before I begin, um, I wonder if we could just have a moment of silence um, for the victims of gun violence, especially Colorado, and especially um, the eight uh, victims in Georgia, six of whom were, were Asian women. Thank you. One of the most frustrating questions I have received throughout my career is which oppression has hindered you more in classics, racism or sexism? The prescient work of the Kambahi River Collective in their statement and the advent of critical race feminist theory has helped me and other black indigenous women of color 
formulate responses which deconstruct such questions and reconstruct, reconstruct the totality of our lived experiences. One such reconstruction is the concept of racialized gender. In discussions about systemic oppression, the broader framework of racialized gender can be specified as gendered racism or racialized sexism. But today, I will be working within the broader concept of racialized gender when discussing ancient Hellenic and Roman societies. Our reception of race and gender in the ancient world is situated within the uh, frameworks we employ, knowingly or unknowingly, to analyze these societies. In recent years, feminist scholars and scholars of race studies have abandoned the, the approaches of positivism and turned to those of social construction and intersectionality. The term intersectionality was coined by the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw in her 1989 article, Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Gender, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory, and Anti-Racist Politics. I love that title because it's so Victorian. You know how Victorians give really long times. Anyway. Um, However, as a concept, it is rooted in the earlier 1977 Kambahi River Collective Statement authored by Barbara Smith, Beverly Smith, and Demita Frazier. The statement was one of the clearest articulations of the simultaneity of oppressions that women of African descent in particular suffer. Since Crenshaw's articulation, intersectionality is spread as an analytical tool beyond disciplines and borders. Inter intersectional projects and methods exist in a wide range of fields from its original jurisprudence, sociology and education, to history, psychology, and even business. Very few theories have generated the kind of interdisciplinary and global engagement that marks the intellectual history of intersectionality. Yes, <laughs> okay. Intersectionality is a critical intervention against the essentialism of critical race theory and is a core concept of critical race feminism, hereafter CRF. The anti-essentialism of uh, CRF has, according to one scholar, quote, provided a critique of the feminist notion that there is an essential female voice. That is, that all women feel one way on the subject. CRF highlights the situation of women of color whose lives may not conform to an essential norm, end quote. Increasingly, scholars of the ancient world are finding intersectionality a useful tool to examine ancient societies, but in a limited way. Often classicists neglect the core axis of race in their application of the concept. For some time now, the concept of social construction has proved fruitful in the efforts to uncover the social constructions of race and gender, which operated in ancient societies. Adrian Catherine Wing notes that social construction thesis helps us realize that, quote, biological races do not exist as recent science has clearly shown. There is more genetic difference within so-called races than between them. Instead, races have been socially constructed and the legal system uh, reifies that construction, privileging some races over others, end quote. The same analysis applies to genders and the intersection of race and gender. A sterling example of the social construction of race in the United States comes to us from Ta-Nehisi Coates. And I quote, 
But race is the child of racism, not the father. And the process of naming the people has never been a matter of genealogy and physiognomy as much as one of hierarchy. This difference in hue and hair is old. But the belief in the pre preeminence of hue and hair, the belief that these factors can correctly organize a, a society and that they signify deeper attributes, which are indelible, this is the new idea at the heart of these new people who have been brought up hopelessly, tragically, to believe that they are white." End quote. While both these modern approaches can get us closer to understanding what Tim Whitmarsh has described as hybridized ancient Greek and Roman worlds, they still are flawed by exclusive binaries, that is, either or, inherited by Western epistemological frameworks and arguably first expressed by Aristotle. For race, recasting Whitmarsh's concept of hybridized, hybridized, hybridization as creolization, is a first step in dismantling these binaries. Furthermore, such reframing aids in breaking down the influence of modern social constructs of race and gender, which undergirds our reception and perception of race and gender in antiquity. For gender, the construct goes back to the 19th century when the rise of eugenic movements and the cult of true womanhood were the scaffolding upon which the gender construct was based. This, the concept of racialized gender provides, I think, a fruitful way of discussing the intersection of race and gender in antiquity. Up to now, it has been Marxist feminists who have applied the concept to labor movements and labor history, where the intersection of race, gender, and class has been paramount to the discussion. However, the broader parameters of the concept can apply transhistorically to antiquity. As Eileen Boris states, quote, race and gender exist in tandem to transform profoundly the ways that each works alone. Constructed through gendered representations, race in turn reconstructs gender identities. The concept of racialized gender reflects the interaction. Furthermore, Boris shows that racialized gender aids in dismantling the simplistic binary that men have race, women have gender, end quote. So how would this very modern concept work when applied retrospectively to ancient Hellenic and Roman societies? Let's go on a journey and examine three case studies, so to speak, Medea, Cleopatra, and Sophonieva. This entails taking a broad view of race to break out of the traditional binaries and coded language, that is using ethnicity in place of race, in, case, in these case studies, I try to stress that the perception and reception of women and men is influenced by racialized gender. I hope to show that the intersection of race and gender in antiquity reflects the transformational nature of racialized gender that Boris described in the, in the quote above. Before discussing the details of the intersection of race and gender in the ancient world, it is important to set out the operating principles of the discussion. First and foremost, 
social con constructs of race and gender existed in antiquity, but they were not the same as modern times. But nevertheless, they existed. However, it cannot be stressed enough that the reception of the ancient constructs of race and gender in later times is profoundly influenced by the hierarchical framing described by Coates and others, pushing against that framing to arrive at a more plausible analysis of race and gender in antiquity is the intellectual and moral imperative of this lecture. Ancient formulations of race and gender, like their modern counterparts, were not static, nor were they immutable. Jonathan Hall notes this in his work on what he calls ethnic groups. I would call them races, but he calls them ethnic groups in Hellenic society. Quote, Ethnic groups are not static or monolithic, but dynamic and fluid. Their boundaries are permeable to a degree, and they may be subject to processes of assimilation and differentiation, end quote. While we can argue that there were relatively uniform Roman constructs of race and gender, we cannot say that there were monolithic constructs in ancient Hellenic societies. These were tied closely to various demographic groups in different city-states around the Aegean. So as far as possible, I'm going to refer to the city-states by name, the Hellenic peoples enshrined different racial categories in their mythic foundations. In this regard, the narratives concerning racial genealogies are forms of social construction as ancient societies strive to explain their racial differences through a shared ancestry. In the myths surrounding the genesis of Hellenic peoples, the ancestors of the three major racial groups are depicted as descendants of Zeus or Helen. Aeolus, Doris, and Ion became the eponymous founders of the Aeolian, Dorian, and Ionian races. Each race also shared linguistic and cultural traits. It is in the latter sphere that the intersection of race and gender is clear. The Ionian people, best represented by Athens, constructed gender and gender relations along rigid lines, especially after the legislation of Solon in the 6th century BCE. Given the importance of racialized gender for the construction of the identity for Hellenic peoples, it is not surprising to find it illustrated in cultural production, especially literature. This brings us to Medea, a mythic character who has become the epitome of racialized gender. She is best known to us from Euripides' tragedy, Medea. And nearly all the receptions of that play from Seneca to Toni Morrison focus on the trope of the mother who kills her own children. But what did Euripides know? He undoubtedly knew Medea as the daughter of Aetes, of Colchis, as the niece of Circe, and so the granddaughter of Helios. He was familiar with the Corinthiaca, now lost, an epic poem which described the death of Medea's children in the temple of Hera. Other versions of the story portray the Corinthians as the murderers of the children. As retribution, the Corinthians were forced to establish a hero cult for the children. 
In the fifth century BCE, the stain of infanticide still haunted the Corinthians. And so they commissioned Euripides to revision the myth. In Euripides' hands, Medea becomes the foreign woman extraordinaire. Yet the description of Medea as foreign, math has a way of masking her racialized gender. So beyond divine genealogy, how did Euripides read Medea's racial ancestry? Herodotus informs us that Colchis was colonized by the Egyptian pharaoh Sesostratus, probably Sesostratus II. Herodotus states, and I quote, the Egyptians did, however, say that they thought the original Colchians were men from Sesostratus' army. My own idea on the subject was based first on the fact that they have black skins and woolly hair, not that that amounts to much, as other nations have the same. And secondly, and more especially, on the fact that the Colchians, the Egyptians, and the Ethiopians are the only races which from ancient times practiced circumcision. End quote. Now, this information from Herodotus comes in th within the context of the construction of peoples other than Hellenic as bar a barbarian, that's Herodotus' word. With this knowledge in hand, Euripides then establishes Medea as racially and culturally other and sets her up as a foil to Jason's racialized gender, one that is constructed as more civilized and hence superior. Euripides' revision has had such sustaining power because it resonated with the later internalized negative perceptions of the racialized gender, particularly of women of African descent. In Jason's soliloquy after the infanticide, he declares that, quote, no woman born in a Hellenic society would ever have gone through with such a crime. And later in the same passage, he invokes animal and monster imagery, a lioness, not a woman, you, more cruel in nature than the Etruscan Scylla. Flash forward to the 19th through 21st centuries, we black women have been masculinized, declared unfit mothers, and portrayed as not just angry, but full of rage. Yet what gets largely ignored is that Jason cannot succeed without Medea's knowledge and skills. And even after the murder of her children, she, not the Corinthians, buries her children and establishes a cult in their honor. It is notable that in Euripides' Medea, it is the chorus of Corinthian women who express the injustice of women's position in Euripides' Athens. These female members of the Aeolian demographic demonstrate a different construction of gender when they reflect on the historical treatment of women. It is the thoughts of men which are deceitful, their pledges which are loose. The stories of women shall now turn our condition into a fair one so that our lives shall achieve proper glory. New value is coming for female kind. No longer shall slanders pollute our story. The poems of long ago bards shall no more portray us as fickle, untrustworthy friends. Bias, because Apollo forbore to implant his lyrics in feminine minds. I tried to do that as a rap, 
but it wasn't working. So my apologies. Um, <laughs> despite this plea for equality of representation in literature and history, the Medea, the play, concretizes the binary between foreign born and native women in the Hellenic male consciousness. Now, before discussing racialized genders constructed by the Romans, we need to establish the gender norm. Just as in the United States, when we say African-American men, we mean black men. I'm sorry, when we say African-Americans, we mean black men. And when we say Americans, we mean white men. So for the Romans, Romani meant Roman men. Roman masculinity, racialized gender in and of itself, was the norm in the texts of Roman literature. Roman society was patriarchal and androcentric. The authorship of the texts that we'll look at, being all male, reflects that. Gender difference is filtered through a male lens, and that lens is the framework for gender difference. It's like a circular argument. Racialized gender was central to the founding of Rome. From whatever starting point one takes, whether the legends of Aeneas or those of his descendants, Romulus and Remus, the intersection of race and gender formed the foundation of Rome's origins. The Julio-Claudians, the founding dynasty of the Roman Empire, claimed ancestry of the god Venus. Furthermore, the Romans constructed a national identity upon the Trojan hero Aeneas. As a son of Venus, he imparted to the Romans a shared ancestry with Venus. Any discussion of racialized gender as it appears in the literary production of the Augustan age would be remiss without explicit attention paid to Cleopatra VII of Egypt. Cleopatra was the inspiration for Virgil's reception of Dido in the Aeneid, and as we will see, for Livy's retelling of the story of Sophonibra. The intersection of Cleopatra's race and gender was paramount, paramount to the treatment that the historical Cleopatra received from prominent Romans such as Cicero and Augustus as Octavian. Consequently, it should be no surprise that this intersection weighed heavily on the literary imagination of the writers of the Augustan period. After all, Cleopatra embodies the racialized gender, which pervades all the fears of the Roman ruling class men. A foreign woman with political power in the geopolitical area, which historically produced Rome's most tenacious and feared rivals, Hannibal and Cleopatra. So how does Cleopatra fare in the Rome Roman and Rome identified authors who dominate the source material and who write their accounts one to two centuries after she died. Let's look at the two major ones, Plutarch and Cassius Dio, both of whom wrote their works in Greek and both of whom embed their discussions of Cleopatra within the life stories of the men. Plutarch especially capitalizes on Cleopatra's racialized gender to draw a portrait of Cleopatra as a highly educated, wily seductress who becomes the ultimate femme fatale for the Roman men she encounters. He never gives Cleopatra an explicit physical description, relying instead on intangible qualities such as the timber of her voice. These intangibles come across as enchanting and her ability of molding her personality to her 
prey, conjures up the shape shifters and tricksters of mythology. Nothing in Plutarch's description leads us to believe Cleopatra was or is worthy of our trust, nor was she worthy of the Romans. He highlights Cleopatra's racialized gender by comparing her to the ideal represent, representative of Roman racialized gender, Octavia. Again, there is no explicit physical description for Octavia, the sister of Octavian, who, is, uh, who was later called Augustus, as you all know, after Cleopatra committed suicide. What does Plutarch say about Octavia? Now, I, I, I have things bolded in my script here, so I'm gonna try to like emphasize with my voice so you know what I have bolded. All right, Octavian, this is Plutarch. Octavian was very fond of his sister, who it is said, he doesn't know, Right, just, just to be clear, he, he, he doesn't know. All right. it, who, it is said, was a marvel of a woman. She was a widow, having been married to Gaius Mar Marcellus, who had recently died. Antony, too, was considered a widower now that Fulvia had died. He, that is Antony, did not deny his involvement with Cleopatra, but did not call it marriage. Though he still wrestled against, wrestled against his love for the Egyptian woman. Everyone supported this marriage to Octavia in hopes that she, since she had dignity and intelligence, in addition to considerable beauty, might support and be loved by Antony, as was fitting for such a woman, and that she would represent the salvation and harmony of all their affairs. In 35, that's the end of Plutarch. In 35 BCE, Octavia arrived in the East with supplies for Antony's war against Parthia. And according to many historians, Octavian, Octavian agreed to this trip in the hopes that Antony would disrespect his sister by staying with Cleopatra in Egypt instead of going to Athens and Octavia. According to Plutarch, upon her arrival in Athens, Octavia received a letter from Antony who ordered her to remain there. But she, though she was upset and saw through Antony's pretext, nevertheless wrote to inquire where he would like her to send the things she was bringing him. And a friend of Antony was sent to deliver this message to him. And he, the friend, brought along with it justified and appropriate praises of her, that is Octavia. Cleopatra perceived that Octavia was advancing on her and feared that if Octavia added to her decorum and Caesar's power, the pleasure of her company and her support of Antony, she would be untouchable and would have total command of her husband. So Cleopatra feigned passionate love for Antony and made her whole body waste away with a strict diet. That's the end of Plutarch. Plutarch mentions how Cleopatra employed lobbyists, that's my word, with Antony to scold him and call him out for being, quote, for being a, quote, harsh, unfeeling destroyer of a woman who was depending on him and him alone. 
end quote. They declared that Octavia had a brother and, quote, enjoyed the name of wife, end quote. But poor Cleopatra, who ruled over many, had to be content with being called, quote, Antony's mistress. And she did not avoid the term or think it beneath her, provided that she could see him and live with him, end quote. And it worked. Anthony was persuaded that Cleopatra might harm herself, and he, delaying his journey to Parthia, returned to Alexandria. Octavia returned to Rome, where, according to Plutarch, quote, she seemed to Octavian to have been mistreated, and he ordered her to leave Antony, end quote. In keeping with her ideal status, she refused to leave her husband's house. We all know the story, right? She stayed and she raised all those kids. There were like eight of them. I mean, come on, lady, you're out, you're nuts. But anyway, um, <laughs> she refused to leave her husband's house and begged her brother, quote, to discount the things that had happened to her since it would be intolerable if the two most powerful rulers sent the Roman people to war, one for the love of a woman, and the other to avenge a relative." End quote. I don't, I, I don't think I would have liked Octavia myself, but that's okay, at least based on, on Plutarch here. Um, <clears throat> she remained true and loyal to her word um, and carried on activism on behalf of Antony. Plutarch concludes the episode, and I quote, in this way, she inadvertently harmed Antony as he was hated for wronging such a woman. Unquote. Cassius Dio, writing around 202 of the Common Era, composes a fictitious speech for Octavian to exhort troops to war and to justify his declaration of war um, on Cleopatra. In all, there, uh, in it, there are all sorts of dog whistles for racialized gender. Dio has his Octavian draw upon Roman history and Roman military pride with statements such as, indeed, for us as Romans, rulers of the largest and best part of the world to be disparaged and downtrodden by an Egyptian woman is unworthy of our fathers. Yeah, okay. And then he goes on to list all the great vi Roman victories of the past. Da Dio's Octavian continues this exhortative invective, quote, who would not lament to hear that Roman knights and senators fawn over Cleopatra like eunuchs? Who would not moan to hear and see Antony himself twice a consul and many times a commander? Who would not weep to see that he has now left behind his ancestral customs, that he has imitated the foreign and barbaric ones, that he does not respect the laws and gods of his ancestors, but bows before that woman like Isis or Selene? names her children, Helios and Selene, and finally calls himself Osiris and Dionysus. Oh, oh. Octavian continues the diatribe saying that at first he was sympathetic to Antony, even married his sister to him, and that, quote, I did not wish to go to war with him because he insulted my sister, or because he did not care for the children he had with her, or because he honored the Egyptian woman instead of her. Now, I considered the first reason to be that the same approach should not be taken with both Cleopatra and Antony, for she was clearly an enemy because of what she did. 
And also because she was a foreigner, but he as a citizen might possibly be reasoned with. End quote. Octavian goes on to say that Antony's rejection of Octavian's favors proves that he is, quote, either irrational or insane. For I have heard this and believe he is under <laughs> that abominable woman's spell. And Octavian blames Antony for bringing another war to the Romans. Quote, since he is enslaved to that woman. Octavian isn't finished. Therefore, let no one consider him a Roman, but rather an Egyptian. Let no one call him Antony, but rather Serapion. It is not possible for someone living in royal luxury and being treated like a woman to think and act like a man. So in a nutshell, Cleopatra signifies a bad woman. She is dehumanized, and so she can become the scapegoat for Octavian's war. Once Octavian becomes princeps and Augustus, it would appear that whenever a Roman author wanted or needed a negative um, exemplum for womankind, a pops a Cleopatra-esque character. For Virgil, it's Dido. For Livy, it's Sophoniba the daughter of a Carthaginian noble, has Jubal Gizgo. In the genre of historiography, there is one episode in Livy's narration of the Second Carthaginian War that lends itself to the analysis of, uh, through uh, racialized gender and offers insight into the racial ruptures of Roman history. Livy's tragedy, so to speak, of Sophoniba delineates the racialized gender not only of Roman men, but also that of men and women of African descent. Further, the character of Sophoniba can be seen as the crucible for the formation of racial and gender identities for the Roman men um, sorry, for, for the Roman male elite in the age of Augustus. <clears throat> Therefore, Roman racial formation and racialized gender formation are constructed on the bodies of two exotic others, Sophoniba and Massinissa. The result then is a social reproduction of ideal Roman masculinity through the transformation of Massinissa's racialized gender from that of a Numidian to that of a Roman. However, none of this is possible without Sophoniba, who undertakes an equally transformative racial and gender performance, moving from a Cleopatra-esque figure to a Lucretia-esque one, that is from African to Roman, mirroring as well as enabling the performances of a Massinissa. I'm going to do my best to give you a summary of the story, but it's a bit twisted, and so bear, bear with me. Um, if you want to make a little chart of all the main characters, um, you can do that, but it, it gets a little involved. All right. Um, so the prominent sources for, for Sophonieva are Polybius, who never uh, names her, and Livy, who, who gives the most fulsome account. Okay, so Sophoniba was the daughter of the Carthaginian leader, Hasdrubal, the son of Gizgo, to distinguish from Hasdrubal uh, Barca, the brother of Hannibal. In a cultural tradition very familiar, familiar no doubt, to the Romans, Sophoniba was betrothed to Massinissa, okay, 
Sophonieba was betrothed to Mathenissa, um, who was the son of the leader of the Eastern Numidians. Okay, so Numidia is going to be divided into two kingdoms. There's the, the East and the West. Um, <clears throat> Uh, right, so she's engaged to Masinissa um, as a way to cement a diplomatic alliance between the Eastern Numidians and Carthage. Right. But before they can wed, a series of broken alliances and political crises ensue. Cephax, the leader of the Western right, um, Numidians, and an ally of Rome was able to conquer Eastern Numidia. Um, and at that point, Massinissa switched his alliance to Rome. Okay. Hasdrubal now needs a new Numidian alliance, and so he marries Sophoniba, to see facts, the king of Western Numidia, forcing Cephax to break his alliance with Rome. So Massinissa goes to Rome, Cephax leaves Rome, goes to Carthage. That's the alliance picture in a nutshell. Um, when the Romans invaded, uh, Africa under the command of Scipio and Lilius, they, with the help of Massinissa, were able eventually to defeat Cephax and Hasdrubal. After Massinissa captured Kirta, uh, Cephax's capital, he impulsively married Sophoniba to prevent her from falling into Roman hands. When Massinissa the property of Rome, Massinissa sent poison to his wife. In heroic fashion, she drank it and died. Now, you're, you probably didn't realize this already, this, the story is, is much more complex and nuanced than even th that kind of complicated summary um, can relate. For instance, each of the two significant ancient sources for the story of Sophoniba relies on racialized gender, uh, gender stereotypes in the characterization of Sophoniba, Massinissa, and Cephax. For instance, Polybius relates that Scipio thought it likely that Cephax was bored by his young bride, who he never names, and hence by his alliance with the Carthaginians. The reason Polybius attributes to Scipio for thinking this is what's important here. For Polybius says it was because, and this is a quote, of the natural fickleness of the Numidians and their perfidy towards gods and men. Polybius does give a hint of Sophoniba's charming and persuasive personality. In this section, Sophoniba is begging Cephax not to desert the Carthaginians, and she is moved by his entreaties. Livy is the source who spends the most time on Sophoniba. We learn from him that Sophoniba was a maid of marriageable age. That, and she, Livy describes how Hasdrubal took advantage of her beauty and charm and of Cephax's passion to bind the Numidian leader more closely to the Carthaginian cause. Livy's portrayal of Sophoniba is taken up uh, when, again, when uh, Massinissa captures Kirta. Mathenissa is spotted by Sophoniba, now named by Livy, who begs the Numidian leader to save her from the Romans. In the act of naming her, 
Livy gives Sophoniba not only agency, but also accountability. She is no longer the dutiful Nubilis Virgo doing her father's bidding. She is now she now has the potential to act in her own name and on her own behalf. Captivated, Massinissa agrees to help her and impetuously marries her. None of this is pleasing to Scipio, who pedantically demonstrates to Massinissa that Sophoniba is the property of Rome and he must turn her over to him. Massinissa, like the good student of Roman ideals that he is, goes off to consider the advice and admonition of Scipio and resolves to send Sophoniba a cup of poison, which she bravely accepts. Now, all of the later sources give notice of Sophoniba's beauty and education, noting that she was well-versed in grammar and music. These authors go on to say that she was clever, ingratiating, and altogether so charming that the mere sight of her or the sound of her voice, who does that sound like, sufficed to vanquish everyone, even the most indifferent. These later sources, no doubt, uh, because of their distance from the events of the late Roman Republic, make the conflation with Cleopatra more explicit than Livy needs to. Nevertheless, the similarity between Sophoniba's and Cleopatra's racialized gender is particularly striking. Whereas the later sources seem to be telling a touching story, Livy's agenda is very different, reestablishing the Roman moral fabric of old, one which has become badly frayed. His main vehicle for this is racialized gender. As a result, each of the male characters has his own political and or moral crisis occurring and each crisis gets resolved by reasserting the normative racialized gender. For instance, earlier in book 29, Livy describes Scipio's crisis um, surrounding the subjugated city of Locri in Magna Graecia. There had been a senatorial investigation it kind of sounds like today, you know, every time something goes wrong, there's a senatorial investigation um, into the complaints of the Locrians and Scipio's role in them. Livy recounts the following charges uh, revealed during the Senate's deliberations. Much was also said against the commander in chief himself, this is Scipio. His dress and bearing were unRoman, if not and not even soldierly. He strolled about the gymnasium in a Greek mantle and sandals, and wasted his time over, oh my God, books and physical exercise. I, sorry for the editorial insert there. Um, the discipline of the whole army had gone to the dogs so that it was more of a menace to his, its friends than its enemies. Now, while many or even most of these charges were untrue, Scipio does have an image problem, and he must reclaim both his moral position as the exemplar of the ideal Roman of ideal Roman masculinity, as well as his political reputation as a military commander. Massinissa and Sophoniba are the tools to his success in this reclaiming. When Massinissa conquers Kirta and defeats Cephax, he is an ally of Scipio and becomes his proxy in terms not only of military success, but also Roman racialized gender. However, Livy makes very clear that Massinissa is racially different to the Romans he is emulating. 
Sophonita is a vehicle through which Livy reminds us that our Numidian hero is a non-Roman hero. The beautiful Carthaginian woman will seduce him and cause him to slip back into his natural racialized gender and stereotype of the Numidian. Let's look at what happens. When Livy first mentions Sophonibo, it is clear that Hasdrubal, her father, is the architect of the scheme to win over sea facts from the Romans. Sophonibo is a pawn in a political move. Hasdrubal is relying on his daughter's beauty and Cephax's passionate nature. However, when Sophonibo is the agent of her own destiny and comes out to greet Massinissa, Livy gives her a speech that demonstrates that she has the pervasive, sorry, persuasive power to obtain whatever she wants, as well as the racial rupture caused by the Roman invasion of Africa. This is Sophonibo, according to Livy. <clears throat> if I had been nothing other than the wife of Cephas, I would have preferred to trust the honor of a Numidian and one born like me in the same Africa than that of an alien and outsider. What a daughter of Carthage, not to mention a daughter of Hasdrubal, has to fear from a Roman, you do understand. If you are able of nothing else, then I beg and beseech you to save me through death from the Romans' will. Livy overshadows Sophoniba's appeal to Massinissa's race loyalty by again repeating the racial stereotype As he, Livy, relates the scene after Sophoniba's speech, he describes her as, quote, outstanding in beauty and at a blooming age. From Livy's perspective, Massinissa heard Sophoniba's speech more as blandishments of a lover rather than entreaties of a suppliant because he is a Numidian and the race of Numidians is inclined towards passion. That is a quote from Livy. As a consequence, Livy says, quote, the victor is captured by the love for the captive. The subsequent marriage between Sophoniba and Massinissa also gives Livy the context in which to contrast the recklessness of Massinissa and the self-control of Scipio. Livy focuses on Scipio showing his controlled handling of Cephax's defection as well as his disappointment and even anger over Massinissa's yielding to his baser instincts. When responding to why he turned from his alliance with Rome, Cephax places the blame on his having wedded a Carthaginian woman. It was madness bred from passion. More worrisome to Scipio, but consistent with Livy's view that lack of restraint has unfortunate consequences, is Cephax's observation that Massinissa was neither more prudent nor restrained than he. In fact, Massinissa is less cautious because of his youth. Massinissa's hasty, impulsive marriage to Sophoniba um, supports Cephax's image of Massinissa and provides the most telling evidence to support Scipio's growing anxiety. Scipio sees clearly the possibility that Massinissa, although he's been very loyal up to this point, 
might now turn to the Carthaginian cause due to the influence of Sophonibo. In addition to his anxiety, Scipio is disgusted, disgusted, <laughs> because following most maiorum, he practiced self-control and resisted the beautiful female prisoners when he was in Spain. When Massinissa arrives, he re uh, Scipio receives him warmly and lavishes public praise on him for his military accomplishments. There follows, however, a, uh, a private tongue lashing. This is Scipio. But of these virtues for which I would seem to have been sought out by you, I should have been prouder of none as much as my self-control and my resistance to bodily lusts. How I wish that you had added this also to your other outstanding virtues, Massinissa. There is not, absolutely not, believe me, as much danger to men of our age from armed enemies as from the constant presence of sensuality all around us. The man who reigns these in and tames them with his own self-control has earned for himself more honor and a greater victory than we have with the conquest of CFAX. Oh my goodness, he's a self-righteous little something in you. All right. Livy demonstrates that Massinissa, passionate Numid Numidian though he may be, is really more Roman than the Romans and shares many of their ancient values. However, Massinissa, like Livy's contemporary Romans, has lost sight of these virtues. Scipio's exhortation to Massinissa not to destroy the many good qualities with the one defect of passion could well be Livy's words to his fellow Romans. Massinissa fully grasped the logic of Scipio's speech and like many colonized people, is caught between two worlds. Does he abandon the colonizer? and lose all the political advantages that might flow from that alliance? Or does he become a race traitor and turn over the woman he loves to Rome? After privately venting his grief, he hits upon a compromise of sorts and provides himself a Neba with the opportunity to commit suicide. When she accepts the cup of poison, she reverts back to her previous gender performance of the obedient woman. By moving from a passive, silent, and obedient daughter to a forthright vocal agent of her own sexual and political destiny, she violates the norm of Roman femininity and becomes the Cleopatra-esque exemplar of the corrupting foreign beauty. When she accepts the poison, she moves back to the obedient, although a certainly not passive or silent, wife, and restores order to the Roman male view of gender norms in the time of Livy. The speech that Livy gives Sophonieba as she receives the poison places her in the tradition of Lucretia, the noble Roman woman who commits suicide for honor. And I quote, I receive this wedding gift, one not unwelcome, if a husband is able to offer his wife nothing greater. But tell him this, I would have died a happier death if I had not wed on the day of my funeral. For this, she earns praise from Livy. Quote, she spoke calmly as she drained fearlessly the received cup with absolutely no indication of trepidation, end quote. Even though Scipio loses a trophy to be paraded in his triumph, who does that sound like? 
he gains so much more because of Sophonima. His crisis of masculinity is resolved by the assimilation of an African man who becomes a shining example of Roman racialized gender, and by the suicide of an African woman whose beauty might have dismantled the Roman imperial agenda. I hope I have shown that the intersection of race and gender, succinctly expressed in the concept of racialized gender, is a useful tool in analyzing the ancient societies of Hellenic and Roman peoples. Donna Haraway makes the argument that, quote, neither gender nor race is something with an origin or example in the family that then travels out into the rest of the social world. Rather, gender and race are built into practice. Unquote. This is as true in antiquity as it is today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shelley, um, for that wonderful detailed talk and all those great quotations. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, we will take questions. Uh, Professor Haley will take questions now. I would invite everyone to uh, either put their name in the chat so I can see you and call on you since there are many people on this uh, call or to simply put their question directly into the chat and I will relay. I will read and relay questions, Professor Haley, just to make this uh, smoother. Um, so uh, Shelley, there are already uh, a few questions and I'm gonna just, um, uh, uh, go through them one by one. Uh, so the first question you have is about uh, the um, what happens to the biracial children of Medea and Cleopatra. And the questioner, Laura Holland Gold Goldthwaite, notes um, that both uh, sets of children are killed. And she asks, have you noted instances of this kind of hybridization being considered monstrous somehow, uh, and therefore such offspring simply had to die? Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, to to the um, the second question about monstrosity, right? Um, um, yes and no. So, who was also biracial? Um, he had to die, right? But that was a political calculation. That wasn't based on the fact that he was biracial, right? Um, I, the children of, uh, of the twins, for example, um, Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene, um, seem to have had very happy lives um, after the, the, the death of uh, their parents. Um, I, 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 it always amazes me that that's how it's described by, um, Folks, um, after all, they they were raised by Octavia, right? She she uh, reared them. Um, we know that Cleopatra Selene went on to become a, a ruler in her own right with with Juba uh, the second, um, and so. Uh, um, from all accounts, Alexander was was um, as far as we can tell. A, Certainly, he adjusted better than, let's say, Caligula or Nero. Um, so um, he 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 seemed to to have a you know a, a fine life. Um, so I don't believe. I mean, I've never read any negative descriptions of um, biracial children um, in the sources. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, it, and, and I think it's be, because we're, we're sort of dealing with the same class of people, right? We're, it's not like there are different class statuses here. Um, so, um, yeah. Thanks. Um, Suzanne Lai has a question. Suzanne, would you like to unmute yourself? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here with everybody and with you, Shelley. Um, 
Uh, and I know we've talked about this a little bit before because, you know, I've always, uh, and so in the context of, I've always thought of like race and gender as like sliding scales that intersect. And I think we've talked about that before. Um, and my question for you, like as I was listening to your talk, was that, you know, it seems like foreignness or say, using that word foreignness, which seems to keep coming up, um, already implies female gender in it. Um, so even when it's used to describe a man, it, you know, whether a man or a woman, right, it's, mm -hmm. it implies it's female gender, but it doesn't seem to work in the other way. Like, so describing a woman, that doesn't necessarily seem to, or does it? That's the question, I guess. Or does it seem to, like, it, it seems like one is more distinctly pointing, you know, towards the two, whereas if you say, like, if you look at a woman, a Greek woman, a Roman woman, and just yeah. describe her as a woman, yeah. um, does that imply a foreignness to it? Um, hmm, that's a, it's a really, really great question. And, and the first thing to, that springs in my mind is, and I think it kind of supports your point that, that um, effeminacy is implied in foreignness, right? And that's when when Yarbis is praying to his father, um, Jupiter Amon, to to um, put an end to this affair um, between Dido and Aeneas, um, the way that he describes Aeneas, right? The, the description that he gives, it he calls him a semi-weir, right? Because I'm a semi weir, and he his hair is dripping with perfumed oils. Excuse me. Um, so everything is pointing to the fact that he is not a man, right? And the same with that um, invective that Cassius Dio makes up uh, about Octavian, right? He says, you know, uh, anyone who is is um, treated. Or, or lives the life like of luxury, like a woman shouldn't be called a man. Um, so yes, I, I I think it's true that it's another um, it's another way to be misogynistic, right? Um, but I still think that um, yeah. Um, it, it definitely the 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 women get the the shorter end of things. You rarely see women, well, except in myth, right? When women are masculinized, then they sort of become monsters, right? Yeah, I was gonna ask that. There seems to be a monster scale somewhere on here yeah, as well. Yeah, like, that's right, that's monster. right. That's Which right, and so- Jackie Murray has talked about a bit too. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, there, it, um, I mean, racialized gender, at least modern way, I mean, I, I always try to hope that things are a bit better in the ancient world, but that's not always the case. Um, but certainly uh, racialized gender is meant to describe a kind of oppression. And so, um, it, it is true that that, that women um, are it, it, it's not a positive, right? The, the outcome of it is is never positive. Um, and I think that's probably also true in in antiquity, especially if the woman is also foreign. I mean, it would be interesting to look at well, let's let's say fulvia. Right, Fulvia violates every whatever bullet point you want in terms of Roman femininity. Fulvia violates those, right? And so she gets described, you know, I mean, she is masculinized, right? Um, based on her actions, the fact that she leads an army and she, right? Um, and what is it Plutarch says at one point? He says Cleopatra should thank Fulvia for um, um, training um, Antony to um, yield to the control of a woman or something. Um, so it's, yeah, yeah. 
but th that's a, that's a really I have to think about that that point that it's it's a really interesting one that it's still womanhood isn't raised up because of racialized gender it's still considered um kind of the lower end of things right yeah um, thank you, Shelley. So here is another question from the chat, uh, and I think this is a question that you've certainly um, thought more about and alluded to early on in your talk. Um, what the questioner asks uh, you to is to reflect further on the difference between ethnicity and race and suggests that uh, Greek was perhaps a linguistic category, and he writes a lot of literature written in Greek after Alexander was written by people who were not born or raised Greek, um, and that barbarians opposite of Greeks were people who did not speak Greek. And so I wonder if you can reflect um, on the question of kind of language, ethnicity, and race, and how you use the word race and racialization. Right. Um, so I just find, um, particularly for those of us um, who want to be um, careful and want to, I don't don't want to make a mistake or, or don't want to say the wrong thing or um, that I, I think in sometimes, not always, but sometimes ethnicity becomes a code word um, or, or a euphemism when race would work better, right? Um, I'm, I'm thinking particularly, I, I note that um, a lot of my colleagues in a broad sense fear that if they talk about race then that makes them racist and the two things are very different right um, you can talk about race that someone is african-american that doesn't make you racist right um so I, I absolutely agree. I mean, um, let's just take Latinx. Latinx is a is a linguistic category, right? Uh, um, so folks who are Latinx can can be white, or they can be of African descent, right? Or they can be Asian, right? So yes, there there definitely are linguistic categories. Um, I, I have the problem, the problem I have with, um, with, with Greek is, is that Greek, you know, when we're talking about the Greeks, right? It, it's, it's, it's a little like, um, the modern day um, umbrella and, and folks here can correct me if I get this wrong, but the, the, uh, modern day umbrella of, of Asian, right? Oh my goodness. I mean, that's a huge category of people, right? And so you, you, you lose the, the specificity when you always talk about the Greeks. Well, who, who are you really talking about? Um, I would say 95% of the time, you're actually talking about the Athenians, right? Um, and so, I mean, the the Spartans are different, right? Absolutely, I mean, though that's the most obvious group that who, who's different to, to to the Athenians. But there there were the um, lesbians, there were the Corinthians, there were the all, all these get lumped in under Greek, and and I don't want to lose that that specificity. Um, I I also want us to. Um, <clears throat> really think about um, race less as something that's physical and more something that's cultural, right? Um, and that too is problematic, okay? I Because that, that opens it up to all sorts of things like, oh, so that means racial, Rachel Dozel is okay. And I'm going, no. No, 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 it's not, no, that's not okay, no, right? But but just to kind of, what we have to do is we have to break the stranglehold of, 
of the white supremacist um, bio um, racism that um, developed, right? That, that's what I'm trying to do, is to kind of break us out of that and think more broadly about what race could have been, right, in antiquity, right? And it's hard, I'm not I'm suggesting at all that this is easy, right? Um, and yeah, so. Shelly, I'm going to exercise my prerogative here as the moderator to sort of wonder uh, with you as a non-classicist in my own field, which is early modern studies. Uh, the early modern studies and medieval studies have, of course, been roiled by similar kinds of conversations about, you know, how, how do we talk about race? And one, one pretty strong answer coming out of critical race theory has been to sort of think about race uh, as a social category, as about right. modalities of hierarchization, about um, forms of power and how they were exercised, and to understand them less as being inscribed on the body in a biological sense, which is, of course, one, one way in which race is conceived in the 19th century primarily, but to explore uh, the mechanisms of social organization and race as the term that names that. So, for instance, in the early modern period, historians have uh, worked on the term Nazio, right, the, the idea nation. Uh, mm -hmm. And how is that, in fact, a racialized category, perhaps? Um, not perhaps race in the sense we might understand it post 19th and 20th century, but in a term that carries that same charge of social organization. And I wonder if that is helpful in the classical context as well. Um, yes, I mean, I, 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 just off the top of my head, I would say yes. Um, I think one thing that often gets, it kind of gets elided is um, the sense of class. Um, it's it's very easy. I mean, all of the, the people, right? Uh, even even Medea, for that matter, even though she's mythical. Um, I, the ringing in my head is what my children would say to me when, when they were little and I was sort of struggling with these things and I was going on. I think it was Dido. I was going on and on about and my, my both my son and daughter would say to me, mom, mom, calm down. They're fictional. <laughs> so I don't want to invest too much in Medea, but um, um, oh, no, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh, they're, they're, they're all, everyone I talked about, right, is of the ruling class. Every single one, every single one. And so when you look at things like graffiti, right? The, the, the graffiti in Pompeii, woohoo. That, mm, yeah, well, wh what does it mean when someone de describes, you know, that they're, they're in love with someone and and um, she, she happens to be um, um, a black woman. That's how she's described Negra, right? She's, she's described as a black woman, but the, the candida woman, which we're not gonna translate as, as um, white, um, the candida woman is jealous and gets angry about this. Well, you know, the, we're not talking about the ruling class now. We're, we're talking about just sort of everyday folks. Um, so um, I, I think, then I think the social um, probably works. I think if you get out of the um, political class and you're looking at sort of the everyday kind of folks, I think um, definitely race is a social category rather than um, the status that we have certainly works. I would say, yeah. Tell you one more question, uh, Jeff. You should. Oh, be thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Haley. That was a fascinating talk and it was so thank wide you. ranging. I really in, enjoyed it. And I hope I have what's a uh, relevant question. Uh, thanks to our wonderful uh, post COVID world. A lot of mm -hmm. us have been taking advantage of seeing a number of talks that we might not otherwise get a chance to see, including yours. Mm -hmm. I heard one last week, which was very interesting, which is the construction of race in the early Lombard world. And mm -hmm. one of the 
the observations, ethnicity is a better word maybe, uh, one of her observations uh, also similarly focused on the association of male gender with regards to themselves. But I was kind of curious about the rhetorical exercise of using barbarians, and I use that put that in quotation marks, to point out the feminine, read weak, uh, racial stereotypes in themselves. And I was thinking of things like Tacitus' constructions of Germanic identity or Procopius' constructions of Ostrogothic masculinity relative to, to Romans, et cetera. And I guess my question really is the degree to which civilization is perceived as feminine in these discourses. Of course, this, well, let's see. One way that Folks, this is not me, this is, goes beyond me, but, but just in terms of um, group identity, right? So group identity formation. How do you determine what your group identity is? And I, and, and I do think this is trans-historical. I think this goes across age, age, um, ages. How do you determine who your group is, right? Right. Um, there's a couple of ways to do to do that. You you could do the both and, right? You could say, oh, um, my people are all the people who wear who wear headphones um, and who are on Zoom. Those are my people, right? Um, so it's a, it's a series of ants. It's additive, right? Or you can do the exclusive, right? I determine who I am by checking off what I'm not, right? And so I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but I think you look, you certainly, um, establish the, um, I'm going to break my own rule, but the ethnic identity, right, of the Greeks, right? Who does he pit them against, right? Does he say it's all the people who eat olives at lunchtime? No, he pits them against the enemy, right? Who are the Persians who do things very different to the to them. The same with his description of the Egyptians. Oh my God, the Egyptians like have sex outdoors. What? What? They're, what? They're barbarians, right? Or they pee outdoor, whatever, whatever he says the Egyptians do, right? So um, yeah, it's, 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 if in the the discourse of trying to do, right, whether you want to call it racial formation or group identity formation, if it's a question of insider outsider, then that, you know, and I think that's the way most Western societies have done it, right? Um, and maybe not just Western. Um, certainly in any society that um, has, um, I think about in my own family, um, my great grandmother was uh, a member of the Anandaga nation, right? Which is part of the Haudenosaunee, right? So, but when, when she married outside of the nation, as she did, right? And it didn't matter who it was, it happened to be an African American, but it didn't matter who it was, she was no longer a member, right, uh, of that group. Um, so that's the way they formed their, and still do, their, their uh, identification. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, Jeff, but, um, I, I think um, the the outsider, the unknown, the foreigner is always going to be portrayed as the barbarian. Worth it's ethnocentrism in 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 a nutshell, right? So we're always superior. Heavens, we are 
right? We're the best. American exceptionalism, we're the best, right? And that's okay. As long as there isn't value attached, as long as you don't go out and shoot people because, right, they're not American, right? Um, Americans are only people who eat apple pie and whatever. Um, I'm veering off into the silly now, but but yeah, so I, I hope that helps. One final question, uh, Tristan, I'm gonna uh, invite you to unmute yourself in one second. Um, it's my friend, Tristan. Go ahead. Hi, Tristan, how are you? <laughs> well, nice to finally um, catch you. I know the last questioner brought that up. Beauty of the virtual world. I finally... Um, yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Tristan so, and I go way back. So <laughs> One of my big influences. Um, so, um, but I'll be try my best to be concise. So I have two interconnected questions. Do you see, because, you know, when we have that, you know, that issue with the race, ethnicity thing, and I've sort of made the same observations you have within, you know, Egyptology and, you know, study is, you know, in classics. Do you think also that there's a relationship between culture and race or an overlap? And the second thing that's intertwined to that, do you think, keep in mind, I'm, I, and I use race and racism distinctively, I make that distinction. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's, with Roman imperialism, that you can make an argument for racism, you know, when during the Roman Empire or as a basis of the Roman Empire? I hope my question makes sense. And that, that's, that's my two questions. Yeah. Um, okay. So let me answer the second one first. Um, well, let me ask, no, never mind. <laughs> um, I really struggle with this question about race and culture, right? Um, is it is it like chicken and egg, or is it? Um, I think um, what what was the number one way, and whether we're talking about Rome or whether we're talking about you know, ancient Hellenic societies or or we're talking about um, modern day, I guess, right? What's the first thing you have to do to make a slave? Right? But what, what's the first thing you have to do? Nobody wants to think about this. Nobody wants to think about this. You strip them of their culture. You take them away from their culture, right? So that would make me think then, if that's true, and this is happening before there was color slavery, right? Right? Then there's culture, and then later, at some point, right? Or we can call culture a race, right? If we're talking about sort of pre-transatlantic slave trade or pre-color slavery. Um, and really, I'm getting out of my wheelhouse here, so, so bear with me. But, but so you strip someone of their culture, right? To dehumanize them, to, to, to right? Disassociate them of what gives them power. Right. Um, so in that way, I mean, I, th I think you could say they're, they're synonymous. Right. Um, so um, and a part of that is, you know, not letting them have their own language. Right. Right. People that you want to enslave, you, you, you take away their um, um the, the way they express uh, themselves. You, you take away their language, you take away their religion or, or their religious practices. Um, you, right, you stifle their, their brains by not allowing them to be educated. Um, so, yeah. Um, now that that happened, right? That, you no, know, look what the Spartans did to the Helots. 
right? That happened in the ancient, these ancient Mediterranean societies, right? Um, so, um, this, so the set, what was the second question again, Tristan? I forgot. Um, it was about um, racism and Roman imperialism. All right. Yes. This is a tricky one, I think. Uh, this is, it really is a tricky one. Um, because the, the, in some ways, the Romans were very clever in that they didn't, they didn't strip people of their language. They didn't say everybody has to know Latin and, you know, and force them into schools like we did the Native Americans and right. Um, so they didn't take away the language. They didn't. Um, but at the same time, they there was a kind of coerced assimilation. Um, so can we call that racism, right? I, I guess so. I mean, I I don't I don't know. To be honest, I have to think about that one. Um, I, I'm down with the imperialism. I'm down with sort of the um, the ethnocentrism of the Romans. Um, I'm just not sure whether I don't know if it rises to the to the. Um, uh, I, I always use Jim Crow as the, right? Did the Romans pass laws that said that the Ethiopians, for example, um, had to use separate water fountains? Well, no, they didn't, right? They didn't. Um, so, yeah, let me... Let me I think this this might be a I think this might be a good time to to release Shelley, um, and uh, and and thank her very much. Um, uh, Aisha and I were uh, uh, just saying that we'd like to uh, invite if if this is okay with with Professor Haley, um, those of you whose questions didn't get answered, may they contact you? Sure, absolutely. Right, absolutely. So your your email is on your is on your Hamilton website, I think. Yes. And it's very easy. It's just S Haley at Hamilton.edu. Because I know and there I were see, some I see my student Lexi from I All right. I Lex. <laughs> and I, I know there are some there are some students um, from other places as well. Right. So, think, right. So right. let us let us thank Professor Haley and um and uh well and and, and say good night. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, so, you much. so much.